Hi guys. Well, I hate to say it's a little bit of a gloomy gray day here in the collapse of everything here on the waning days of summer 2024. It is now Wednesday, September 18th, <coughs> 2024. And uh, so guys, I know it, it, even if you're fairly new to the Doomosphere, you have heard probably, uh, good Lord, how many references to the limits to growth. The uh, number one best doomsday prophecy since, I guess, Rod uh, Serling died. Anyway, uh, I think it was written in 1972 the original, and there's been several updates. Uh, I have read the original and the updates, I'm happy to say, but I understand that the vast majority of people who are uh, always talking about and hearing about the limits to growth have never read the book, never will read the book. Uh, <clears throat> and so since I understand the reality you know, it's just like uh, Project 25, Agenda 21, all, all of these things. And, and I'm guilty of it myself a little bit. They, you know, where I act like I'm some sort of expert on something. Never read the damn thing. But anyway, over here at Medium.com, I have just found this excellent, is the word primer or primer? Uh, I always prefer the pronunciation primer, kind of the Cliff Notes version of uh, the limits to growth by some person or group I have never heard of in my entire life calling uh, themselves Finance Fusion Hub, Finance Fusion Hub of all places to find a doomer but anyway whoever finance fusion hub i think has done an excellent job of distilling what did the limits to growth say uh so take it away finance fusion hub <coughs> the limits to growth economic reflections on the fragility of modern civilization and anyone who has never seen this graph I've always loved this graph this is kind of what uh, we're coming into on the planet here in the middle of the 21st century this is what collapse looks like in the famous graph Although, I think uh, probably the uh, this computer did not even show you the graph. But anyway, be that as it may. All right. In the twilight of the 20th century, I'm not sure, 72, anyway. In the twilight of the 20th century, if you remember that, that uh, ancient history, a cadre of researchers at MIT, that's the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, I believe, issued a stark warning to the world. Our current trajectory, if left unchecked, would lead to societal collapse by the mid 21st century. Their study the Limits to Growth, published in 1972, used the pioneering tools of computer modeling to simulate the complex interplay of population growth, resource consumption, industrial output, food production, and pollution. And, and I just want to interject here because they didn't I uh, remember in 1972, climate change uh, was barely factored into this, into the limits to growth. It was kind of 
may be lumped in with pollution, but you know what I'm saying. It wasn't a, 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 any kind of major factor looking at the situation more than 50 years ago. Anyway, just pointing that out since the authors didn't. It was a harbinger of the unsustainable path that modern civilization in all its technological grandeur might be traversing. Fifty years on, their predictions appear disturbingly prescient. A recent follow-up by a KPMG analyst, I have no clue what KPMG means, and I wish there had been a link, but there's not, a recent follow-up study by a KPMG analyst suggests that we are not only on track, but ahead of schedule. The implications for global economics are profound, and if anything, more relevant today than ever. So this is looking more from an economic uh, collapse perspective than an ecological uh, collapse perspective. But it's, uh, you know, it's all the same ball of wax. So what is the mirage of infinite growth? <clears throat> At the heart of the MIT study finds a fundamental challenge to the economic orthodoxy of perpetual growth. The post-war period, meaning the post-World War II period, if you're losing track of what war they're talking about, which saw unprecedented economic expansion across the globe was fueled by the belief that growth was both infinite and inherently desirable. This belief underpinned the economic policies of most industrialized nations, driving them to pursue ever higher GDP figures as the primary measure of national success. Yet, the limits to growth report posed an uncomfortable question. What happens when growth exceeds the planet's capacity to sustain it? The study's simulations suggested that without significant change in policy and behavior, economic growth would inevitably lead to environmental degradation, resource depletion, and ultimately a sharp decline in industrial output and living standards, a scenario that closely resembles what the researchers termed the business as usual model. Of course, I would add the, the usual business 50 years ago a, you know, as a piker compared to what's going on on this planet today. <clears throat> the core of the issue is that our global economy operates much like a jet engine, remarkably efficient and powerful, but also highly vulnerable to disruption, just as a single fault in an engine's complex network of components can lead to catastrophic failure, so too can the intricate web of global supply chains, financial markets, and resource dependencies unravel under the strain of unchecked growth. Talking about what they're talking about is the uh, complexity of modern global industrial civilization. Okay, so let's look at the economic consequences of resource depletion. You can figure out what you, for yourself what the environmental consequences of resource depletion. 
but these guys are looking at the economic consequences of resource depletion. <clears throat> the concept of resource depletion is not new. Classical economists like Thomas Malthus warned of the dangers of population growth outstripping food production as early as the 18th century. However, what the limits to growth model introduced was a more sophisticated understanding of how resource depletion coupled with environmental degradation could trigger a cascade of economic failures. Consider the case of industrial output, a key variable in the MIT study. For most of the 20th century, industrial production was seen as the engine of economic growth, driving higher living standards and technological progress, yet the study highlighted the dangers of overproduction, particularly when it comes at the expense of environmental sustainability. In scenarios where industrial output continued to rise unchecked, the resulting pollution and resource exhaustion eventually led to a collapse in both production and consumption. The economic implications of such a scenario are staggering. A collapse in industrial output would not only lead to massive job losses and economic stagnation, but also disrupt the global supply chains that modern economies depend on. The ripple effects would be felt across every sector, from agriculture to finance, as the interdependence of global markets exacerbates the impact of localized failures. So we're now going to talk about pollution, the invisible tax on economic growth. And this is where, to the small extent that they were even looking at climate change, this is where uh, you, you, you could take that in and put this section on steroids. <coughs> Pollution, as modeled in the Limits to Growth study, is not merely an environmental issue, but an economic one as well. It acts as an invisible tax on economic growth, gradually eroding the productive capacity of both natural and human capital. The cost of pollution manifest in myriad ways, reduced agricultural yields, increased health care expenditures, and the degradation of infrastructure, just to name a few. The study's simulation showed that if pollution were allowed to rise unchecked, it would eventually reach levels that significantly impair economic productivity. This, in turn, would lead to a decline in industrial output and, ultimately, a reduction in living standards, I bet. The economic theory of externalities provides a useful framework for understanding this dynamic. Pollution represents a negative externality a cost borne not by the polluters, but by society at large. Without intervention, the market fails to account for these costs, leading to overproduction and consequently overpollution and certainly overshoot. In economic terms, Addressing this externality 
requires either regulation or the internalization of costs through mechanisms such as carbon pricing or pollution taxes. However, the political and the economic challenges of implementing such measures on a global scale are formidable. Ain't gonna happen. Particularly in a world where short-term growth often takes precedence over long-term sustainability. So now let's draw some dots between population dynamics and economic stability. <clears throat> One of the more unsettling aspects of the Limits to Growth study is its exploration of population dynamics and their impact on economic stability. The model illustrates how population growth when coupled with finite resources leads to increased competition for those resources, driving up prices and exacerbating inequality. In this scenario, the wealthier segments, can you say the billionaires, the wealthier segments of society may continue to consume at unsustainable levels, while the poorer segments face growing scarcity and economic hardship, which is exactly what we're seeing today. This dynamic creates a feedback loop. As resources become scarcer, economic inequality worsens, leading to social unrest and further destabilization, destabilization of economic systems. The consequences of such a scenario are not merely theoretical. We have already begun to see the impact of resource scarcity in regions like the Middle East and Africa where competition for water and arable land has fueled conflict and mass migration. The economic fallout of such instability is difficult to overstate. Mass migration, for instance, places enormous strain on both the economies of the source countries, which lose valuable human capital, and the host countries, which must absorb and integrate large populations. You see how that is going in Springfield, Ohio this week. Similarly, social unrest can disrupt economic activity, deter investment, and lead to the collapse of public services. Can you say Haiti, Nigeria? All right. So let's look at the ambiguity of technological salvation. Yes, a recurring theme in critiques of the Limits to Growth study is the potential for technological innovation to avert the worst case scenarios. Indeed, the models <coughs> most optimistic outcome called the comprehensive technology scenario suggests that with sufficient technological advancement, it may be possible to sustain economic growth while mitigating the environmental and resource constraints. Ain't gonna happen. Yet, this optimism must be must be tempered by a recognition of the limits to technological solutions. While innovation has historically driven economic growth and improved living standards, it has also introduced new risks and uncertainties. 
the very technologies that have enabled the rapid expansion of industrial output and consumption such as fossil fuels and synthetic chemicals are now recognized as major contributors to the environmental challenges, I would say environmental collapse we face. Moreover, the assumption that technology will always provide a solution is a dangerous one. It risks fostering complacency and delaying the implementation of necessary policy changes ain't gonna happen. In economic terms, relying solely on technological innovation to solve complex systemic problems is akin to betting the future of global civilization on a single roll of the dice. So, uh, we're now going to enter La La Land uh, in, the, in the, as you could expect, the ain't gonna happen uh, hopium starting to creep in to this up till now excellent essay with the hilarious knee slapper toward a sustainable economic paradigm. I, okay, guys, we, do, we just need to break in here. There is no such thing as a sustainable economic paradigm, period. There is no such thing as a sustainable economy. Economies, uh, cities, uh, the, the, the whole civilizations are by definition unsustainable. So just so you understand, there is no such thing as moving toward a sustainable economic paradigm because there is no such thing as a sustainable economic paradigm. But, uh, just put that on the back burner for a minute and plow on ahead. <clears throat> the implications of the limits to growth study for contemporary economic policy are profound. It challenges the conventional wisdom that growth is always good and that more is always better. Instead, it calls for a re-evaluation of what constitutes true economic progress, one that accounts for environmental sustainability, resource efficiency, and social equity, otherwise known as ain't gonna happen, ain't gonna happen, and ain't gonna happen. In this context, the concept of a steady state economy ain't gonna happen has gained traction among some clueless moron economists. A steady state economy is one in which the goal is not continuous growth, but rather the maintenance of a stable level of economic activity that can be sustained over the long term without depleting natural resources or degrading the environment. The only thing it is degrading is uh, our intelligence. Why this will not happen is because achieving such an economy would require significant changes to the way we think about and measure economic success. GDP, the current standard metric of economic performance, would need to be supplemented or even replaced by measures 
that account for environmental health, resource availability, and social well-being. This shift would also necessitate a move away from consumption-driven growth toward a model that prioritizes efficiency, innovation, and sustainability, which is why it ain't gonna happen, ain't gonna happen, ain't gonna happen. So, what is the conclusion? The economic imperative of a new growth model, which ain't ever gonna happen. As we approach the critical year of 2040, 2040, so uh, th these folks are giving us 16 years to uh, turn, the, uh, turn the freight train around, uh, as they would say in the cliche world. As we approach the critical year of 2040, the predictions of the Limits to Growth study serve as a stark reminder of the economic vulnerabilities inherent in our current model of development. While the potential for collapse may seem distant or abstract, the trends identified by the MIT researchers are already visible in the form of environmental degradation, resource depletion, and social instability. The challenge for policymakers, economists who laugh, policymakers who laugh at the limits to growth, economists who laugh at uh, the limits to growth, and business leaders who laugh at the limits to growth is to navigate this complex landscape with foresight and prudence. It will require not only technological innovation, but also a fundamental rethinking of what economic growth means in the 21st century. If we fail to heed the warnings of history and continue on our current trajectory, we may well, meaning we will, find ourselves facing the very collapse that the MI study foresaw, a collapse not just of economies, but of the very fabric of modern civilization. Hallelujah. And that is something that is going to happen. The sooner, the better. But with that, yes, little dog, did you survive that? Ah. With that, the little dog and I uh, need to get up there, and you need to run those uh, mousies out of the tiny housey, and uh, I think I might have a five-gallon bucket to go clean out of my outhouse before this woman from Hawaii shows up at Bugs in a Jar Farm to get out there and enjoy it while she still can. Bye, guys.